Now, let me explain something to you. I'm off the lectionary because we're going to talk about the fruit of the Spirit if you read your newsletter. This is the passage that comes before, which was part of last week's lectionary from Galatians. They cut out that part about circumcision. They cut out the part about castration. Some of you sort of looked a little like, ooh, when you read that. I don't blame you. And I know we usually don't say that word from the pulpit, but without understanding this passage, we can't understand anything that comes after it. Here's your Bible quiz du jour. Where is modern day Galatia? Galatia from the first century is modern day what? Anybody know? Turkey, where Ephesus is. Okay, so that's pretty far away from Jerusalem, right? Okay, that's where Paul wrote this letter. He sent it to the churches in Galatia. Now here's your big Bible quiz, and I said at the first service, anybody who can now, if you were at the first service and you answered this, I'm not giving you my car, I said, I was so confident that no one would get this answer, you could have my keys to my car and drive away free and clear. If you can tell me how many years there were between Abraham and the giving of the law to Moses on Sinai. Any idea? Let me hear a guess. 600? Nope. better than the guesses we got at the first service, they said maybe 100. It was over 400 years, over 400 years between the giving of the law and um, Abraham walking the earth and being called by God. You need to know these things to understand this book. And to understand this book is to look at Paul. This is Paul ticked off. This is Paul angry. This is Paul writing a letter saying, what has gotten into you people? Because he said, everything I taught you while you were with me, you've forgotten. Now this is where the Jewish part of the people who follow Jesus splits off from the people who came to Jesus as Gentiles. Like I said, Ephesus and Galatia were pretty far away from the place where Jesus was, where the Jews were living in Jerusalem and in Israel and that area. But they had moved around and this word was spreading. Now Paul is really angry at Peter. They have sort of a battle at the beginning of this book of Galatians, and it's only six chapters, so I would advise you can go home and read it probably in 15 minutes, if that takes you that long, to read the whole thing. But Peter, remember Peter in Acts is sent to a place, and what drops down from the sky, but this huge sheet filled with animals, and he said, God said, kill and eat. He said, I'm not going to eat those, they're unclean, and God said, don't say that what is, I've said is not, that I've said is clean is unclean. Peter had started to minister to the Gentiles, but then Folks in Jerusalem got angry at him, and Peter wimped out. That's the only way to say it. He caved. He said, nope, can't do it. And that's when Paul becomes the apostle, the missionary to the Gentile word, and Peter sort of sticks with the folks back in Jerusalem. So Paul is saying to them, why is it now that suddenly you're back to the old ways? Because the Jewish Christians were saying what? They had to submit to the law, and the law requires what, guys? Circumcision. Now, Paul said, if you have to be circumcised, then you're subject to the whole law, which means that you're going to get your righteousness by obeying the law, which Paul is saying, no, 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 no. Righteousness comes from who? Alone, Jesus Christ. So he's saying to them, if you're going to get circumcised, you might as well just go all the way. And you know that C word that we just read that everybody sort of cringed over. That's how angry Paul is at this moment because he said, you're trading Christ for law. Law's not going to get you there. Now, look back at when the law was given. How many years after Abraham did the law come into being? Over 400, remember? I just told you that about 13 seconds ago and you've already forgotten. Over 400 years passed, so was Abraham really under the law? No, there was no law. So Abraham, and if you read the book of Hebrews, it said it was reckoned to him because of what? His faith. It's his faith that got him to God. Picture Abraham, if you will. We don't have anybody in this church, I think, probably as old as Abraham was when he decided to leave. Mill's well, probably getting close, but not even there. <laughs> not, no, you're, you're a little farther than that. Abraham is a man of wealth. He's a man of lands and flocks and herds, and he's ready to sit on the porch and put up his feet and say, Ah, and God says to him, I have a job for you. I want you to get up and go. And Abraham gets up and goes on the basis of this conversation with God. 
not the God that he had known before, but this God who called him and said to him, your descendants will be as numerous as the stars, as numerous as the grains of sand on the beach, and Abraham goes because of his faith. So Paul's saying, be like Abraham. Not that he has a problem with Moses or the law, but the law was given for two reasons. One, the kids, the kids got it this morning. What is it? What's the law given for? To keep you in line, right? How many of you have laws that keep you in line? Husbands and wives, right? There are things that you do to keep yourself straight, on the straight and narrow, right? But then the law is given also to keep you safe, to keep you from hurting yourself. God said to the people, they were running amok, and he said they need some sort of guidance until the day of my arrival in Jesus Christ. And so the law is given to them. The law that keeps them in a good relationship with God and a good relationship with each other. Because look at how many of those laws deal with other people. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shouldn't cover what your neighbor has. Now, the books of law are called what? By our Jewish brothers and sisters. The Torah, right? The Torah. What are the first five books of scripture? See, I'm going to just quiz you today until you're just so tired of this. Genesis, very good, and we read from Leviticus today, didn't we? Now, let me draw your attention to what it says again. You shall not hate in your heart any one of your kin. You shall reprove your neighbor, meaning you can correct them in love, or you shall incur guilt yourself. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against any of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And there's this lovely punctuation phrase after that. I am the Lord your God. I am the Lord. That always gets my attention. You know, if, if anything ends with I'm the Lord, you know you're supposed to pay attention to it. So Paul is drawing from this passage as well as Jesus. We read what Jesus says when they're trying to trick him. The Pharisees had heard that the Sadducees were put down by Jesus, so they got together, and one of them, who was the expert in law, questioned him. Which commandment of the law is the greatest? Jesus said, you shall love the Lord your God with your heart, your soul, your mind, and... The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all of the law and the prophets. Which makes me wonder why they wrote so much. If we could sum it up in one line. But people were not ready for it yet, were they? They weren't ready to understand that, that everything that God commands is about love. So then we go to Galatians again. And in the midst of all this, circumcision versus not circumcision, following the law versus not following the law, if you submit to the law, then you're, you're subject to the law. But is there anyone who can be good enough to get to God on your own? Let me ask you that. Can you get to God with just obeying the law? You can say, oh, Lord, it's hard to be humble when you're perfect in every way. I do all these things so very well. I don't drink, I don't cuss, I don't fool around. I'm such a good Christian. Can you get to heaven that way? No. You get to heaven how? By the grace of God in Jesus Christ. Christ alone. Now, this week at Bible school, a four-year-old came up to me and said, Pastor Terry, I know about what happens to you when you die if you're bad. I said, really? He said, yes, you go through the dirt to the fireplace, and you live there all your life burning. That's what we tell kids. That's what they hear from what we say. Now, if we're left on our own devices, that's what happens. But we have grace, we have peace, we have truth from Jesus Christ. And Paul... Paul, who wrote so many books of the Bible that I had to study night and day when I was in seminary, says that you can sum up everything in one commandment. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And what does he say about the only thing that counts? It's not about whether you're circumcised. It's not about whether you follow the law. It's not about this or that or the other. The only thing that counts is what? Faith working through love. I get criticized for preaching too much on love. I don't think I can preach too much on love. It's not something I'm making up. It's not some progressive Christian idea. This is the heart of the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you don't love each other, that is a problem in God's eyes. Because then you're looking at getting to Christ through obedience to laws. But what does that say to us? Does that say we don't have to stop at the stop sign? Does that say we're not supposed to do what Jesus asks us to do? It's a hard decision, isn't it? What to do and what not to do. And this is one that's always read without the circumcision passage, without the castration passage for the 4th of July, for freedom Christ has set us free. There are so many things that we're able to do as Americans, right, that we have freedom to do. You can hate anybody you want as an American, right? Nobody can tell you who to love. But Jesus Christ 
says, oh yeah, you can't hate people. You can't seek vengeance against those who are your enemies. You can't have enemies if you're in me. You just can't do it. You've got to live a different way. So here we are in the 21st century. And the passage that gets me every time in this one is, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. If, however, you bite and devour one another, take care that you are not consumed by one another. We're living in a precarious age in our nation's history, aren't we? Where people are devouring each other, they're biting at each other, they're snapping at each other. It was really great at the first service, somebody said she and her brother decided to unfriend each other on Facebook because if they friended each other, they just fought about politics. You don't do that with your friends, right, on Facebook? No. No, a lot of people won't do that, and that's a good thing. Because we're going to disagree on political methods, aren't we? We're going to agree on, disagree on political leaders, which is why we use the passage from the psalm that we read this morning. Don't put your trust in princes. Don't put your trust in a political party or a particular president or nominee. Put your trust in God. Because is there anybody on this earth who can solve the world's problems other than Jesus Christ? We're called in his name to go forward in love. Now, what would happen in your family if the rule of love took over the rule of fussing at each other? What if it became about love in your own family? Not, not necessarily the people who live under your roof because you love them or you'd go crazy if you didn't. But how many of you have an uncle or a brother-in-law who just says stuff that just plucks your last nerve all the time? What if you loved each other despite your differences? What if you loved each other because of your differences, what if you could sit down again and talk about politics without screaming at each other or, or attacking each other? The world would be a different place. What if this congregation gave up old grudges? I'm sorry, there are old grudges in this congregation. I've heard about them. You know it's true, right? Anybody going to deny that one to me? Every congregation is the same. People remember things that happened 25, 35, 45 years ago. I've told you before about going to someone's 50th anniversary party and somebody else in the church came up to me and said, you know they had to get married, don't you? People like to dig up dirt and dish dirt on each other, but not in the name of Jesus Christ. We can't do that. We've got to let it go. We've got to let it go, let it go, let it go. What if the world learned from us? What if it started at Epworth and flowed through the community of Cockeysville? What if it flowed from Cockeysville to the state of Maryland? What if it went from Maryland to the United States? What if the United States went throughout the world? That people with different opinions and different faith traditions could get along if we just allowed ourselves to love instead of going to our corners and hating each other. It's hard. It's hard to love sometimes, isn't it? But Jesus Christ gave himself on the cross so that we might know love because he loved us. This is why I love Holy Communion. It's what reminds me all the time of why I answered God's call. Holy Communion and baptism are the two things that got me into ministry. I was going to go in as the diaconal minister back in the day. They don't have diaconal ministers anymore because people said women are not called to be pastors. So I said, okay, I will do this other job. And then I heard the pastors saying the communion liturgy, and I said, no, that is what I'm called to do because this is grace, peace, and truth in the name of Jesus Christ who looked at those at the Last Supper who were about to deny him, desert him, and betray him. He knew what they were capable of. He knew where they were headed, and yet his love for them was strong because he did not let anyone's behavior change who he was or what he was there to do. It's one of the hardest things about being a Christian. I think it's one of the hardest things about being an American, not to let anybody else change who you are and who you know you are called to be. And so when we come forward this morning, we're not coming forward. I always say that. I'm so used to 30, 35 years of coming forward and then two years of sitting in the pew or being at home. When you take that cup this morning, we do have some gluten-free ones, Phyllis. I hope you got a gluten-free cup. We ordered them for you. Leslie's going to bring you one right now. Um, we're going to share in the body and blood of Christ, knowing that just like this at the Last Supper, we really have made a mess of things, haven't we? Is there anyone here who can go to God with your head held high saying, me first, me first, I did it right. No, we go on our knees, don't we? We go on our knees before Christ to say, as sad and as sorry as I am, as broken as I've been, you accept me and you love me and you'll love me to wholeness. But the cost of that for me is to love others as you've loved me. 
or we make a mockery of what Jesus did for us for the sake of the world. It's hard, isn't it, to be an American these days? Too many people think they have the answer. And I always tell people, if you voted for the guy that did not win in any election, not this one, in any election, pray twice as hard for him because you think he's doing a lousy job. Pray for the president. Pray for the governors. Pray for the leaders in Congress. Pray that they might see the truth of God in Jesus Christ. They might act out of love for all people. I'm very grateful to be an American. I really am. I'm grateful for the laws that protect us, even though I don't agree with all of them. I'm grateful for the history that brought us to this place. But it's a history that's got a mixed bag in it. Now, when the forefathers, not the foremothers, the forefathers wrote that Declaration of Independence, they left women out altogether. And they kowtowed like Peter did. They kowtowed and left slavery in the books. Our history has some problems in it. But for the most part, the United States works toward the arc of justice. That's who we claim to be, and that's who we can be in the name of Jesus Christ. It just takes us setting an example for the rest of the world. So think of the person who argues with you politically more than anybody else, no matter what your position is. Because you know what I've heard? There are Republicans in this church. Did you know that? Did you know that, Milt? There are Republicans here. You know there are Democrats here? Oh, my Lord, there are Democrats here. No? Yeah, there are. There are Libertarians here. There are socialists here. Oh, my golly, Moses. And you know what? We can all get along with each other because we can put the common good ahead of our own idea of how we should get there. We can do that in the name of Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sake and the sake of the world. I miss the day when we could talk about politics and debate because I learned from people who didn't agree with me. But now we just devour each other, don't we? Unless we listen to Jesus Christ and to God who said, I am the Lord, you shall love your neighbor. The whole of the law can be summed up in love your neighbor as you love yourself. And if the only thing that counts is faith working out itself through love, we have a calling and we have the ability to do it. So I'm sorry that we had those C words in this service today, that circumcision and that other one that's like Paul saying, all right, if you're going to circumcise yourself, just go for it, guys. He was angry. That's some anger there. But we can get beyond that looking what it is to live in the spirit because that's what the fruit of the spirit is about it's not a nice little fruit salad made of nice happy thoughts it's who we are called to be and what we're equipped to be in the name of Jesus Christ so I invite you now to think on these things as we sing together about everyone coming to the table of Jesus Christ and then we'll share together in the sacrament of his love for us would you join in singing standing as you're able